And so, Lord God, that's our prayer. Seems like a crazy prayer, but we ask for your fire. We pray that your fire will fall and burn away our flesh, our self-centeredness, our fear, our shame, uh, the lies that we live in and that we believe and that you would reveal your kingdom within, your fire within, because we're your temple and there's a fire in the depths of your temple and Lord God, you are that fire. You're the consuming fire, your love, and your good. And so come, Holy Spirit. Be glorified in us. Blow the ashes from our skin and reveal your kingdom deep within. In Jesus' name, we ask that you'd help us to preach. Amen. In the uh, mid-1980s, I had this job. As assistant high school youth director, at Bel Air Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles, California. It was Ronald Reagan's church, as well as church for folks like Kenny Rogers and Carol Lawrence, Steve Allen, Cheryl Ladd, who had worked in the junior high department. It was all pretty exciting for a kid like me, but it was rather depressing for Eloise. Eloise was a secretary for the youth department. She was single, divorced, and rather old. Actually, I did the math this, this week. Turns out she was 56, younger than I am now. But anyway, I thought she was old, and for Bel Air, she just wasn't much to look at, and rather unrefined. She wouldn't use the intercom. She'd just yell, Peter, get the phone! She wasn't a great secretary. She wore jeans because one leg was skinny from a, a bout with polio when she was younger. She wore jeans and tell to her horror the new assistant pastor made her wear dresses in order to project the proper image. I, I really enjoyed Eloise, but most folks treated Eloise like a second-class citizen. Nothing overt, because after all, this was, this was church. So people would say please and thank you and God bless, yet with short attention spans, impatience in their demands, their eyes, with their eyes they would communicate, I've judged you and I've named you. Psychologists tell us that the subconscious mind is incredibly adept at reading subconscious signals which we subconsciously emit. When we, when we see something we desire, our pupils dilate subconsciously as if the person or thing that we desire, uh, as if we're taking that person or thing in. And when we see something that we judge undesirable, our pupils constrict as if to keep that person or thing out. We can't help it. There's a Hebrew word that can be translated pupil or apple and is used to describe God's people, the apple of his eye. The word is ishon, literally little man, little ish. It refers to one's own image reflected in the eye of another. When another looks at you, you see yourself reflected in the pupil of their eye. Whether that pupil dilates or contracts tells you what they think of you and you become their pupil. They teach you. Eloise read the eyes and learned the lesson. Most people esteemed her not. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, prophesied Isaiah, and we esteemed him not. We once regarded Christ from a human point of view. We regard him thus no longer, writes Paul. Well, one day, Eloise brought this old scrapbook to work, and I had to beg Eloise to let me look at it. She finally let me. I opened it up, and there was the young face of our uh, youth department secretary on the cover of Vogue magazine. I turned the page, and there she was on the cover of another magazine, and another magazine, and, a, and another uh, magazine. This is Eloise on the cover of True Confessions in 1947. Here she is on the cover of True Confessions in 1948. This is Eloise advertising Paul Mollive soap. This is her advertising Sweetheart soap, and this is her advertising Ivory soap. Uh, are cover girls born beautiful? Asked the advertisement. One day Eloise told me that she had been roommates with Grace Kelly. 
Another day, she told me that she had dated John F. Kennedy. I said, Eloise, you dated John F. Kennedy? She said, oh yeah. I said, well, well, what happened? She said, well, I dumped him. I said, Eloise, you dumped John F. Kennedy? Why'd you dump John F. Kennedy? She said, Peter, he was boring. He was all politics and stuffy. One of my favorite things to do at Bel Air Presbyterian Church was walk up to Eloise's desk while snobby people were looking down upon her pushing her around and I just say, hey, did you know that Eloise was on the cover of Vogue magazine? Did you know that Grace Kelly, Princess of Monaco was, well, that was Eloise's roommate. Did you know that Eloise dated John F. Kennedy? But not only did she date John F. Kennedy, she dumped him. And all at once, all at once, their entire demeanor would change. For their judgment had changed. Eloise Name had changed. No longer secretary to the youth department, but cover girl. And their eyes would dilate. I'm convinced that Eloise loved me. Think of that, cover girl. She, she loved me, but she would hate it when I would do that, when I would say things like that. She'd say, oh, Peter, stop it. Just stop it. You're embarrassing me. At the time, I was, what, 20? 22 or 23, I I didn't really understand that. Well, how we see people changes how we treat people, and how we treat people changes people. It creates people or desecrates people. Eventually, um, the judgments uh, of people at church, the demand that she would wear a skirt to keep up appearances, it just all got to Eloise, and she lost her job. Before I left Los Angeles, I went to visit Eloise with a friend. She lived alone in a dark one-bedroom apartment, entirely paranoid. She would not go outside. She wouldn't even answer the phone. If it rang, she just went into a panic. She kept muttering, what will people think? What will people think? What will people think? And I'm sure I said to Eloise, Eloise, it doesn't matter what people think. But soon after, at the age of 60, my friend Eloise died alone in that apartment. And you see, all my fawning over her supermodel past didn't help. I imagine it only made things worse. Cover girls may be born beautiful, but they don't stay beautiful. At least not in the eyes of this world. They don't, they don't stay beautiful, just as young men may be competent and powerful, but they don't stay competent and powerful. They gradually turn to dust. And so you see, our encouragements are oftentimes discouragements, for we congratulate each other on our ability to accumulate dust. In a can of ashes. So I've often wondered, what could I have said to Eloise? or to the demanding people that would stand at her desk with judgment in their eyes, what could I have said to her that would have helped, that would have quenched that thirst and healed her soul? For the past two weeks, we've been preaching about the woman at the well, Jesus and the woman at the well. Eloise reminds me of that woman and her empty water jar before that woman turned into a fountain. You know, Jesus... um, Don't know if you've ever noticed this, but Jesus was a ladies' man. Did you know that? Seriously. I mean, it's rather surprising once you pay attention, but can you think of one female in all the Gospels that Jesus ever really reprimands or speaks poorly of? Other than maybe, maybe his mom at the wedding party when she kept wanting him to turn water into wine, but but other than that, I mean, Jesus is so sweet to women, and he was sweet to his mom, of course, too. It's so sweet to women, but men? He calls them whitewashed tombs. Woe to you, you whitewashed tombs. I mean, he's, he, 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 well, I mean, he gets on his disciples. He, he, he scolds his disciples. He looked at Peter, his best friend, and said, get behind me, Satan. But women? They can be possessed, they can be prostitutes, they can be infected with disease, weeping at his feet, and he sings their praises and makes them the very first evangelists, like Mary of Magdalene or the woman at the well. And I suppose that all makes sense when you consider the fact that he is called the eschatos Adam, 
which means ultimate man, the last man. He's the man that everyone has been waiting for, the perfect image of the invisible God, and we, humanity, you and I, are his bride, the, the, the bride. And in the Bible, groom and bride become one body, and that body bears the fruit of life, even eternal life. I honestly find the Bible to be rather, well, I find it to be a rather ridiculous book, unless you take it seriously, unless you take all of it seriously. If you pick and choose the parts that make sense to you, it will never make sense of you, seriously. And by seriously, I don't mean literally, as modern people mean literally, I mean more than literally. The Bible is more true than your experience of space and time. The Bible begins with a story that modern people have not taken seriously, and thus they don't take most of the Bible seriously, and they don't take the Word of God, the eschatos Adam. They don't take Jesus seriously. They read the story like they read an instruction manual for the microwave, and so they think it's simply about a naked man, a naked woman, and a talking snake, and so they miss the point entirely. Or make the point that there is no point, for the story couldn't have actually happened according to them. Modern people utterly miss the point that the story is entirely about them. It's about a garden that exists not only in Palestine, but in the depths of every human soul. A garden, not only in the past, but at the edge of time and eternity, eternity which is now. A garden that is also a city and a body and a bride, a garden where we're all finished in the image and likeness of God. I've written some books on the topic, if you didn't know. Number one, the history of time and the genesis of you, which is about the biblical truth that in space and time we are still being made in the image of God. And secondly, God and his body, the romance of Adam and bride, which is about the biblical truth that God creates us through the romance of the gospel. And one day I hope to write number three, the tree in the middle of the garden, which will be about the biblical truth that God in Christ Jesus finishes the job of creating us on a tree in the middle of the garden, a tree that we often call the cross. And so why am I telling you all of this? Well, because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, Adam says something to Eve that I believe Jesus, the eschatos Adam, says to each one of us. And I think that we can say it to each other. And when we say it to each other, I want us to believe that it's not just psychobabble, religious nonsense, or wishful thinking. I want us to believe that it's the Word of God that creates everything that's anything. And I think I could have said it or something like it to Eloise in 1984. Hopefully remember that God just speaks a word or words in Genesis chapter one and all creation happens. And on the seventh day it is finished and everything, everything is very, very good chapter one. But in Genesis chapter two, the Bible begins, oh, I should say everything is very good, everything is finished, including you. But in Genesis chapter two, the Bible begins to describe you and your creation. And although I may not know you at all, I'd venture a guess that you're not entirely good, right? Which means that you're not entirely finished, you are still being created. In Genesis 2, God breathes into the dust and begins to make Adam, which is normally translated man or mankind or humanity, because humanity can't find God our helper. God puts humanity to sleep and from the side of man makes woman. Man names her woman for she's fashioned from the side of man, just as the church is fashioned from the side of Christ with body broken and blood shed. In Genesis chapter three, a serpent tempts the woman to make herself in the image of God, although God already said that he would make us, make her in his own image. The serpent tempts her to do this by taking fruit from, from this tree in the middle of the garden, so she takes knowledge of the good, which is also the life, and everything begins to die. 
She ate and gave some to her husband who was with her. He would not leave her nor forsake her. St. Paul writes, Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now, that makes no sense if Paul was talking about any old Adam, because Paul is super clear that every Adam, every man, except one, sins. So maybe Paul is not talking about any old Adam. Paul is the one that teaches us all about the eschatos Adam, who will not leave us nor forsake us. Well, the woman eats and death enters the human race. The woman eats and Christ is sacrificed on a tree in the middle of the garden. The woman eats and the black plague sweeps across Europe. The the woman eats and six million Jews are tortured and exterminated. The woman eats and everyone that you have ever loved suffers and dies. The woman eats. In Genesis 3, 9, God finds the woman and that first Adam hiding in fig leaves in shame. He curses the serpent saying, I will put enmity between her seed, her offspring, and your seed, your offspring. He, singular, the seed, shall crush your head. He's talking to the serpent. And you shall bruise his heel. Then God curses the ground, saying to Adam, because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, in pain shall you eat of the ground all the days of your life. You are dust, and to dust you will return. Next verse, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, our verse, the man, Ha'adam, the Adam, called his wife's name, his Isha's name, Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Are you paying attention? (laughs) Did you just hear that? Because that is the exact opposite of what we would expect the Adam to say, right? I mean, the woman has just listened to Satan, committed the original sin, resulting in the death of all life and all suffering, sorrow, and loneliness in humanity. You would expect Adam to say, you stupid wench, you dumb woman. That's the last time I listen to you. That's the last time I let you do the talking. And now you better obey the rules, join an accountability group, and get your act together. You would expect some new legislation. You would expect some religion. You would expect him to name her the mother of what? death. But instead he names her Eve, which means the mother of all living, or quite simply the mother of life, as in the life. He names her that because she was that. (laughs) according to Genesis chapter three, verse 20. The verb was is in the perfect tense, indicating that this has already happened and is perfected. It is finished. It's not that she might be, not that she could be, would be, or should be, but she already is the mother of life. So how could Adam do that? He doesn't name her according to what she has done. He names her according to the word that God has spoken. In in chapter one, God had said, let us make humanity in our image after our likeness. And and it was so, and God saw everything that he had made that would include Eve, and behold, it was very good. In chapter three, God had said, the seed of the woman, he, singular, will crush the serpent's head. So this Adam in Genesis 3.20 names her mother uh, of life. This Adam knows the good, which is the life, and that Eve will give birth to the life, not only to living things, but all the living, the life. So, So anyway, Eve works death, and Adam names her the mother of life. How could Adam do that? Well, maybe this isn't simply, not simply, the first Adam. When Adam fell, God's son fell because of the true union made in heaven. God's son could not leave Adam, for by Adam I understand all men, writes Julian of Norwich. Adam fell from life to death into the valley of this wretched world and after that into hell. God's son fell with Adam into the valley of the virgin's womb. 
And so St. Paul writes this, Adam was a type, a tupos in Greek, an imprint. It refers to the empty form left by pressing a figure into clay. It refers to an empty space destined to be filled with a substance. Adam was a type of the one who was to come, the substance. Adam was a type and all people are a type because we, male and female, are all Adam. We are all empty humanity destined to be filled with Jesus the Christ. The substance belongs to Christ, writes Paul. Even now, every good decision in you is the life of Jesus manifesting in you. He is your righteousness, writes Paul. So Adam... This Adam names the woman, taken from his side, he names her, but not according to what she has done. And what has she done? Well, she listened to a lie and so tried to make a name for herself. The snake tempted her to take the knowledge of the good in order to make herself in the image of the good, who is God. Jesus is the good in flesh, Jesus is the life, and Jesus is the eschatos Adam. So Jesus must have somehow been on that tree in the middle of the garden. So I hope you see that the fruit of the tree is not bad, but how we take it can be the very definition of evil, and how we receive it can be the very definition of the good even life. Eve listened to the lie and took knowledge in order to make a name for herself, and instead of making life, she made what? (laughs) Death. You remember what Jesus said to the Jews who tried to justify themselves with knowledge of good and evil? You're of your father, the devil, the father of lies. Now, the devil cannot make real people like we talked about last time. He can only make false people, imitation people. Uh, Actually, he can't even do that. With lies, he can get us to make false people. Perhaps they are the offspring of the serpent that God mentions in Genesis 3. Well, when you name yourself, that is, when you judge yourself according to what you've done, you make a false self. I think that's the spawn of the devil. I think we normally call it an ego. It is who you are not. It is constructed with your judgments, which are disobedience, darkness, lies, and death, which you see are not a substance, but they are an absence. It is filled with pride, shame, and fear, which in reality are nothing but the manifestation of a lie. It is the void, it is the manifest absence of the way, the truth, the life, and the light in you. But then what happens when you come back to the, to the tree in the middle of the garden. When, when we come to know Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead, what happens then? When we hear him say, Father, forgive, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my breath, my spirit. When we know Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ has come to know us. What happens when we see that what we have taken has always been given? What happens when we receive the body and blood as a gift rather than uh, something that we take as our due? What happens when we receive the eternal seed? Well, God reveals the new Adam in us, the new man. Faith, hope, and love in you are the word of God in you. You can't make love. Love makes you with his word. And Christ in you is God's judgment in you, mercy in you, light in you, the way, truth, and life in you. You don't determine God's judgment. God's judgment determines you. The me that God creates is who I am, and who I am is actually I am that I am in me. Who I am is eternal. And yet being revealed in space and time in me and even as me. So check this out. 
who I am takes the very shape of who I am not. So who I am not is like a womb for the formation and revelation of who I am. In the very place it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God, writes Paul. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. In the very place of my bad judgment, God reveals his good judgment. God's judgment is grace. God's judgment in me is his word in me. It's Christ in me. So this is the utterly amazing part. Jesus is God's judgment of, of, of me. Jesus is the revelation of who I am, perfectly filling and annihilating who I am not. Jesus is the Son of Man, which makes man the mother of Jesus. It turns out that old Adam is Eve, and Eve gives birth to the new Adam, which is who we truly are. So we actually are the bride and the body of Christ, giving birth to the life of Christ in ourselves and this world. And why do I get so worked up about this? Because I want you to believe it's not religious mumbo jumbo. It's not just psychobabble or wishful thinking. It's called what? Reality. Reality. You are not your own creation. That's what I'm saying. It's really profoundly simple. You are not your own creation. You are the good creation of God being manifest in time and being born out of time into eternity. Now, you need to get, to a, you need to get a beer, go sit by a river, and just ponder this for like 30 or 40 years. But right now, this is what I hope you would believe right now. You cannot make a name for yourself. You cannot make a name for yourself other than lies. And yet there is a name that has already made you and is revealing you in time as you are born out of time and into eternity, and the name is Jesus. And the name means God is salvation. There is enmity between the false self and the true self, for the false self, the spawn of Satan, believes that it is salvation. And the true self knows that God is salvation. And that self, the true self, is who you truly are. I don't know why my thing is keep making this noise, but just pay attention, because now I'm getting to the point. With every, with every word, with every glance, we can judge people for what they've done and feed the ego, the spawn of Satan, or we can proclaim God's judgment and help people become who they really are. And so, so I could have walked up to Eloise's desk in front of everyone in the room and said, hey, hey, did, did you guys know, did, did you know Eloise has been, well, she's been cleansed with palm olive and sweetheart soap and ivory soap, but even better, she's been cleansed with the blood of the lamb. She not only dated John F. Kennedy, she's betrothed to Jesus the Christ. She not only roomed with Grace Kelly, but the Spirit of God, who is grace, makes his room in her heart. Her face was on the cover of Vogue, but even better, her face is reflected in the eyes of God because she is the apple of his eye. Eloise was born a cover girl, but she's getting filled with the glory of God. If we saw her as she truly is, we would drop to the floor in hor holy terror before the eternal brilliance that is... Eloise. I could have said that. And it would have been a true confession. But if I had said that, Eloise probably would have still said, stop it, Peter. You're embarrassing me. Stop it. To her, it would have sounded like psychobabble, wishful thinking, or religious mumbo-jumbo. But you know, if I had believed that about me, you see, I might have also believed it about her, such that whenever I saw Eloise, she'd see her reflection in the dilated pupil of my eye and have just a little more faith in the reality of God, who is love. 
The way we see people changes people. The way we see people changes the way we treat people, and the way we treat people can tell them who they really are. When people believe who it is that they really are, they become who it is that they really are, the image and likeness of God. As a man thinketh, so is he, writes Solomon. It's what every good parent does with their children, right? You don't make your child make a name for themselves. You give them a name that makes them who they are. You say, Jonathan, you don't treat your sister like that. That's, that's not who you are. Becky, you're not mean. I know you. I know who you are. Now you may say, but Peter, we don't know who people are. And that's true. You can't name them. And yet, you can name them. They, they have a name, like a first name that God will reveal at the end of time, but they also have a surname that God has revealed from the dawn of time. They are the image and likeness of love. They are the body of the eschatos Adam. They are the body of Jesus the Christ. So if a name won't stick on Jesus, it won't stick on them. They may have done the works of the flesh, fornication, idolatry, envy, drunkenness, competition, and the like, but that's what they've done, not who they are. They are the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good, and faith. They are the creation of God. And, and the miracle is that as we confess what we've done and receive the Word of God in that very place, the very works of the flesh that we have done are transformed into the fruit of the Spirit, which is what God does. And who it is that we actually are. I have a friend whom Satan tried to name the mother of death. But in prayer, Jesus revealed to her that she is the mother of life. Several years ago, she called me uh, on her way to a meeting about going to an orphanage in Africa, and she said, Peter, pray for me, for who am I to go on a thing like this after all I've seen and the things I've done? I remember I said, well, would you consider holding a dying AIDS baby in your arms? Would you consider that to be a gift? And she just gushed. She said, oh, yeah, I would consider holding that baby to be the greatest gift in all the world. And I said, well, few people in all the world can say that, and that's why you should go. It's a gift to you. And so you are a gift to Jesus in the temple that is that baby. You see, she didn't have to love. She desperately wanted to love. It was the fruit of the Spirit, the birth of herself, her true self. She now runs a mission organization as a mother to hundreds of orphans in Africa. She's the mother of life, and so are you. And Jesus is the life. The word of grace in the place of our emptiness and sin gives birth to a new desire, and that's love. And God is love. And love in flesh is the eschatos Adam, who it is that you truly are. Jesus is and always has been God's opinion of you. And his opinion is reality. What you can do by taking knowledge and trying harder is actually nothing. But what God does do when you receive his word and speak his word is the new creation. All things filled with God and united in Christ Jesus. My old friend Eloise made a name for herself. And so she struggled to believe the name that made her himself. She made a name for herself, and so she struggled to believe the name that made her himself, his beloved, his bride, and his body. But if she has not yet believed, she will believe. For he will not leave her nor forsake her. Even if she makes her bed in Sheol, even there he will hold her. 
Even in the depths of Sheol, he will hold you until the end of time, if need be. But how much better if you surrendered to the eternal word right now? And so he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is uh, the eternal covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, my blood. The life is in the blood. When you come to this table, you confess what you have done. You have taken the life of God on a tree in a garden. And when you come to this table, you receive what God has done on a tree in a garden. He has given you his life, his word. He has given you his name. You must no longer attempt to make a name for yourself. You must receive the name that makes you himself. The name that makes you and all things with you. So just pray this prayer with me. Lord God, I confess that I have been trying to create myself. And now I would like to believe that I am your creation. So if you're like me, I know something about you, and that is that this, well, I know that you've been trying to create yourself. And you suck at it. <laughs> now, that sounds like pretty bad news. But it's in pretty, actually pretty incredible news. It's the gospel because once you come to believe that you can't create yourself, you can begin to believe that you are God's creation. And everything God creates is good. And it is finished. We learn that at a tree in the middle of the garden, and yet it's always true. And when you believe it, the serpent's game is up. <laughs> Your eyes open, and this world loses its power. So in the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen. Every battle, every heartbreak, through every circumstance, help me believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion.